Welcome to the uh, third video for Chapter 3, Basic Sentential Logic, Informal Fallacies, Cognitive Biases. Uh, this video I'm going to introduce two more uh, inference rules, the rules of modus tollens and uh, disjunction introduction. So modus tollens, oh, typo already, should be two L's, sorry about that. Um, this rule says that if you have a conditional, and if you have the negation of the consequent of that conditional on another line, then you can derive a new line consisting of the negation of the antecedent of that conditional. Um, so this is a rule that, like modus ponens, um, applies to uh, conditionals. But remember where modus ponens says the two pieces you needed were a conditional and the antecedent, here, you need, uh, the two pieces you need are conditional and the negation of the consequent. Okay. Next rule, disjunction introduction. This rule says that if I have a statement on a line, now this is, I want to emphasize something here. You're pretty much always going to have a statement on a line. Okay, because this, remember, these can be atomic or compound. Now in chapter four and in the chapter three optional material, we'll talk about statements where you actually start a proof with no premises. So in those cases, you won't already have a line anywhere. There won't already be a state. There won't um, already be a statement that you have that you're starting with. But most of the time, you're always going to have a line with a statement on it. That's pretty trivial. So this is a minimal requirement. Any statement, you're going to have that. But if you do have that, whatever this statement is, you can write on a new line a disjunction that has that original statement as one disjunct, and then the other disjunct can be anything you want. And the, the new disjunct can be on the left or the right. Remember, the, the verbal description of the rules is less misleading. It just says if you have a statement, you can write a new line consisting of a disjunction that has that statement as one disjunct, any other statement as the other disjunct, and it didn't specify which goes on the left or right. So I, we could have written the rule this way as well. Statement, new disjunction that has that statement as one disjunct, the other disjunct is just any other statement. Now you might look at this and think, hey, this is kind of a weird rule. Where did beta come from? Well, where did it come from? The answer is it doesn't matter for now. Um, generally, it comes from your plan, or it comes because you needed beta to be the other disjunct for some reason. Um, why does this work? Why is it okay if beta is any statement? Beta could be a contradiction here, by the way. It doesn't matter. Remember the key feature that these rules of inference have to have is truth preserving. That's the important feature of these rules. Any rule that's truth-preserving is fine as far as the proof method goes. And you can see this is going to be a truth-preserving rule. Because remember, for a disjunction, a disjunction will be true if either disjunct is true. So if we know alpha is true, then we know that beta or alpha is going to be true. And it doesn't matter what beta is. Beta could be a contradiction. It could be a compound statement using atomic statements that aren't already anywhere in the proof. It doesn't matter what it is. If alpha is true, then this, this disjunct is true, and that's enough to make the whole disjunction true. So that's why this rule is okay, even though it seems kind of weird. Let's work some examples. So here we have uh, an argument. It's got four premises. Conclusion is R. Um, I'm going to put our two conditional using rules down here. Why didn't we also have two rules that use disjunctions now, ds and di. Why didn't I put these down here? Well, I can just look here and see that there's no way I can use ds because there's no disjunctions here. And disjunction require ds requires a disjunction and the negation of one disjunct. So I can't use ds. Could I use di? Sure, I could use di on any of these. Cuz remember, the only thing you need for di is a statement. That's a statement. That's a statement. That's a statement. That's a statement. So I could use di on any of these. Um, 
but it turns out that that's not going to be useful right away. You'll see why um, in a minute. One of these will be useful. We can just go through. Um, there's three conditionals. Both MP and MP require conditionals. But the other requirement's different. For MP, I need a conditional and the antecedent. For MT, I need the conditional and the negation of the consequent. Do I have that anywhere? Here's a conditional. Do I have the antecedent? Do I have W? Nope. So I can't use modus ponens on line one. Do I have the negation of the consequent? Do I have not R anywhere? Nope. So I can't use modus tollens on one. What about two? Conditional, do I have the antecedent? Do I have not S? Nope. Do I have the negation of the consequent? So not K, the negation of the consequent would be K. Yeah, right there. So I could do modus tollens on two and four. I have a conditional, I have the negation of the consequent. And modus tollens says if I have those, I could write the negation of the antecedent on a new line. So the new line I would get would be S. I'm just gonna keep going through though and see if there's anything else I can do. This is a conditional. Can I do modus ponens or modus tollens with that? Do I have W? Nope. I mean, W's here, but remember, it has to be on a line by itself. So I can't do modus uh, ponens. Do I have the negation of the consequent? Do I have S? Nope. So the only thing I can do is I can do modus tollens on two and four. Conditional negation of the consequent, and I can derive on line five, it would be the negation of the antecedent, so I would be S. Okay, now everything's changed. I've got a new piece here. So it might be that even when I was here, I couldn't do modus ponens on any of these, and I could only do modus tollens on two and four. Now I've got S. Is there anything that's opened up? Uh, sure, look. Now I can do modus tollens with three because now I do have the negation of the consequent. So I can derive the negation of the antecedent. Well, the antecedent is not W, the negation of that is W. So I'm gonna get W on line six and that's by three, five modus tollens. Well, I'm still not here, I still want R. Now what can I do? Well, I've got a new piece here. Maybe there's another modus ponens or modus tollens or something I can do. And sure enough, you can see I can do modus ponens now because this is the antecedent of that. So I can get R from modus ponens on one and six and R is the conclusion, so I'm done. I've completed that proof. Woohoo, okay. Let's do another one. Four premises and um, the conclusion I want to derive is not M. So I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, okay, um, if M then not W, can I do modus ponens? Well, I don't have M. Can I do modus tollens? Do I have the negation of that? Do I have W anywhere? No. <clears throat> Here's a conditional. I don't have W, so I can't do modus ponens. Do I have the negation of this? Well, that would just be R or not P. I don't have that, so I can't do modus tollens. What about this? Um, if I had Z or X, I could do modus ponens, but I don't have that. I also don't have the negation of this, so well, it looks like I'm screwed. Well, no, I'm not, because look, suppose I did have Z or X, right? That would be great, I don't, but suppose I did, right? Suppose I could derive that somehow. Well, that'd be cool because then I could do modus ponens to get not P and then I might be in business, right? Maybe that piece would be great. How could I get Z or X? I mean, I don't have it. I'm just sort of right now, I'm just kind of like, this is my wish list. I'd be great if I could get Z or X here. Well, remember the rule of DI. Okay, DI says that if I have a statement, it doesn't matter what it is. I can derive a disjunction that has that statement as one disjunct and anything else I want as the other disjunct. And look, I do have Z up here. So the rule of DI would let me go from Z to Z or X, right? I have a statement, so I could derive a disjunction that has this as one disjunct and then anything else I want as the other disjunct. Well, what do I want? I would want X, because if I get X here, then I can use it for modus ponens. 
So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to use, so this now I'm, I've erased my wish list. I was just kind of using that line up here. I haven't derived this. This was just kind of me planning ahead. So I'm going to go back. Now I know what I want to do. I want to actually get z or x, and I'm going to derive it from line 1 di. Okay. I have a statement. I can derive a disjunction that has that statement as one disjunct, and anything else I want is the other disjunct. Now it's anything else I want. Why didn't I put p here, or q, or uh, maybe this other disjunct could be a contradiction, like b and not b. I could do that. That would have been fine in terms of di would let me do that. Why didn't I do that? Why did I go with x? Well, because this is what's useful to me. If I had z or r, let's say, that would be fine as far as the rule of di goes, but z or r wouldn't help me with the proof. Where z or x does help me, because now I've got this antecedent here, so I can do modus ponens on 4 and 5 to get the consequent. So I have, an, I have a conditional, I have the antecedent, I can derive the consequent by modus ponens. Now what? Well, let's look back up at line 3. Remember, I'm just going to go back to the beginning of the proof here for a second. As I was walking through asking myself, can I do modus ponens, modus tollens on any of these, I got to here and I said, well, can I do modus tollens? No, to do modus tollens I would need the negation of this consequent. I would, I would need r or not p. Because negation is the, of r or not p is the consequent here. Well now, this is where I am. I've got not p here. So I can use di to get r or not p, right? So I can do this. I can do di on line 6. I've got a statement. I can write a disjunction that has that statement as one disjunct and anything else I want as the other disjunct. Well, if I put r here and I make it the first one, now this is the negation of that, right? So now I can do modus tollens on 7 and 3. 7, 3 modus tollens. I have the negation of the consequent. I can derive the negation of the antecedent. The antecedent's not W. The negation of that is W. And now you can see that, look, I've, this is the negation of that consequent. So I can do modus tollens again to get the negation of the antecedent. So I can get not M by 2, 8 modus tollens. And now I've got the conclusion here. So the proof is done. Okay, let's do one more example. Same thing. We can just sort of go through the possibilities and see what happens. I've got two conditionals. Can I do modus ponens or modus tollens on either of them? Well, do I have et, not s? No. Do I have r? No. So I can't do modus ponens with either of these. What about modus tollens? I would need l. I'd need the negation of that. I don't have l. I would need not g, the negation of that. Don't have it. So I can't do modus ponens or modus tollens. Now you might look at this and say, oh, maybe I can do modus ponens on this or modus tollens on this. No, because remember, it has to be on a line by itself. Line 1 isn't a conditional. Line 1 is a negation. The conditional is just the component of that. Okay, so I can't do modus ponens or modus tollens using this conditional because it's not on a line by itself. Okay, so modus ponens, modus tollens are out. Remember, you can always use di, but um, there's nothing, there's no point in that now. The other rule we have is ds. Remember, ds is if you have a disjunction, you have the negation of one of the disjuncts. And we can do that. Here's a disjunction. And I don't have not l anywhere. I don't have the negation of the first disjunct, but I do have the negation of the second one. 
Second disjunct is at G then R, and I have the negation of that right here. So we can do DS on four and one to get L. Okay. And now, very cool, look. I have L, that's the negation of this, so I can get the negation of that by another application of modus tollens. Okay, now what can we do? <clears throat> um, look at the conclusion that we're trying to derive. If not R, then G, or S. Because we have the rule of di, that means any time you're trying to derive a disjunction, any time you want a disjunction, one of the ways you might be able to get that disjunction is if you just can get either disjunct by itself, then you can just um, disjoin the other disjunct by using the rule of di. Well, look, I have this second disjunct here, right? That's line six. So I can use the rule of di, s, I've got, here's a statement, new disjunction that has this statement as one disjunct, and I want it to be the second disjunct. Why? Because I want my, the new one to be this, because basically I'm just creating this disjunction. I'm using this rule to create this disjunction here, and I do that by having this statement as my new disjunct and making this one first and this one second, and the proof is over. Okay, so that's it for this uh, video. Uh, next up, a uh, couple more rules.